Well, uh, so our first talk is uh, Magali Bardet speaking about improvements of algebraic attacks for solving predetermined min rank instances. Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, can you hear me? Because I just lost audio. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. Thank you. So I will present you uh, the work uh, in this paper that is a joint work with Manon Bertin. And so the first part of the paper is about the min rank problem. So uh, we are interested in the computational min rank. It's an easy problem that probably all of you already know. You have uh, K matrices in a finite field and you want to find a non-trivial linear combination of the matrices that has a small rank. So the input are the matrices and you want to find the X. And so this is exactly the decoding problem for matrix code in rank metric. Uh, and it's an NP compute problem. And it is uh, largely used to cryptanalyze uh, multivariate and code-based crypto system. And I'm interested here in the different modelings that exist for this problem. So the first one was the kidney shamir modeling. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is, so I take here a matrix that is the formal sum of the input matrices with variables uh, to represent the, uh, the values we are looking for. And uh, this matrix has a rank at most r if and only if we can find uh, at least n minus r linearly independent vectors in the kernel. So we can write uh, a system like that, uh, that is uh, bilinear in the entries of r and in the entries x of the matrix here. Uh, a second modeling uh, is the minors modeling where uh, a matrix has rank at most r, if and only if all its minors of size r plus 1 are 0. And uh, note that here, uh, we put the identity here at the beginning, and it corresponds to the hypothesis that the last r columns of m are independent, and it expresses the first n minus r as a combination of the last r columns. And if we do the same hypothesis here, we can restrict uh, the system to the minors with, uh, that correspond to the last R column plus one uh, in the N minus R first ones. So it's a less uh, number of minors. And this uh, modeling was completely studied and analyzed by Foge, Saf Foge Safeldin, and Spellenauer in 2010, and we know exactly the behavior of the system when we want to solve it, so usually by computing a problem basis of the system. For the kidney shamir modeling, we have upper bounds, but uh, it's less clear. And now I come to the third modeling, that is a more recent one, the support minor modeling. So the idea for this modeling um, is uh, if you consider this relation here, it means that this matrix uh, is orthogonal to this code. And uh, being orthogonal to this code uh, means being uh, in the dual code that has a generator matrix like that. And so uh, if every row of this matrix belong to this code, then we can write all those matrices here with one row of M and uh, a matrix generating the code and cancel all the minors of size R plus one because we have a redundant row in the matrix here. So we have uh, another modeling. And you can see that uh, here we have bilinear equations in the entries of R and in the entries X here. Uh, so equations of degree two. Here we have less unknowns, but the equations have degree r plus 1 in x. And here uh, we have both uh, kind of unknowns, and the equations have degree r in the entries here, and 1 in, so in total degree r plus 1. And the 
purpose of this paper is to analyze the relation between the three modelings and between the three algebraic, uh, so between the, the three ideas generated by the three kind of equations. And the result is this one. The Kipnis-Shamir equation and the support minors equation generate exactly the same idea. And the minors equation that depends only on one uh, set of variables is included in the intersection of the Kipnis-Shamir ideal and the variables. So this is the main result. I will not give you the proof, it's all in the paper, but uh, can, something we can say that is uh, important uh, is uh, if you start from the Kipnis-Shamir equation, you can produce the support minors equation just by multiplying the Kipnis-Shamir equation by monomials in uh, the entries of R of degree R. And when you do that, uh, you end up in degree R plus 2, and you get degree false and produce equation of degree R plus 1 that are exactly the support minors equations. And uh, if you multiply now by the x monomial, by monomials in x, uh, at degree r plus 2, uh, you get also degree false and you produce exactly the minor equations. So, in some sense, the Kipnis Shamir equation contains in degree r plus 2 all the other equations. And on the other hand, you can uh, try to start from the support minor equation and multiply by monomials in both uh, set of variables. And when you do that, as the kipnis shamir equation are already included in the support minor equation, then you produce again the support minor equation in degree R plus 2. And as you already add the equation in the system, you expect to get a lot of unnecessary computation and CCGs. So, um, the idea when you see uh, that is to compute with the support minors system. Uh, that is to say, to start with very high degree equation in the Kipnis Shamir modeling, but you just want to multiply by the x variables because, uh, in some sense, starting with the support minors, you already add multiplication by the r variables. And you expect uh, for a generic system a regular behavior up to degree r plus one, and after that you will get the minor equation. So uh, that's the idea. And uh, another idea that is very important to solve the system, uh, and why it is uh, easier to solve than the other uh, Kipnis-Shamir and minor equation, is that for the support minor equation we can use a change of variables, uh, that is uh, the Plucker coordinates. Um, and uh, what we can do is to separate all the minors we have into uh, like a different uh, set of equations. If you look at the equation, um, they seem to be of degree r in the r entries of r and 1 in the x variables. But in fact, if you have columns uh, in the last R uh, columns of here, uh, then you have equations of degree much less. In fact, you can have equations of degree 2 to uh, R plus 1. And so you can sort your equation by degree. So it's uh, the same as uh, sorting by uh, number of elements in the first n minus r uh, columns. And if you do that, by expanding the minor uh, uh, along the first uh, row, you can write all the equations as uh, something linear in x time a minor of degree d plus 1 and a minor of degree d. Uh, and as you can express all equations in terms of minors of r, then we do the change of coordinate and use just the minors of R instead of the entries of R, and it allows to have equation of degree just 2 instead of uh, R plus 1. And uh, we can also sort the unknowns uh, by degree, so the unknowns are the 
monomials, product of one X and one minor. And if you, we do that, we can try to linearize this system. Uh, so linearizing the system is just writing a Macaulay matrix where all the rows are uh, the equations here and the columns correspond to the monomial, all the possible monomials. And when we do that, we see that all blocks of equation of degree uh, D uh, correspond to monomials of degree just uh, D plus 1 and D. So we have a Macaulay matrix with this shape, where here we have equation in one block that have non-zero entries just in two blocks of columns. And the exception is for the first block because we had degree four, so equation of degree R plus one, uh, monomial of degree R plus one are not here. And so uh, we can try to linearize the system. So in the previous paper on uh, from PQ Crypto uh, 2019, uh, the authors called superdetermined mean rank instances, instances where in one block we have degree falls. And uh, maybe now uh, in the sight of all the previous relations between ideals, it would be better to call superdetermined mean rank instances instances where we can uh, solve the system with a full rank matrix here by taking all the possible equations. Um, in particular here, uh, we have very interesting equations because they depend on just one block of variable. And so this is, uh, I think, an open problem to try to solve uh, this matrix with uh, something better than just uh, linear algebra on a, on, on a generic matrix. And in particular, if we can solve just a uh, part of the matrix here, and we have a full rank uh, system on this part, then it is possible to come back to the solution. So we do not need uh, all the time to, to compute the national form on the entire matrix. And to conclude the talk, I just want to present an application to a key encryption mechanism that was submitted to the first one of the NIST uh, standardization process. Uh, it's a code-based crypto system in having metric based on quasi adic alternant code. Uh, it was totally broken by Barely and Couvreur in 2018. Uh, but uh, uh, the interest here is that, in fact, their attack was a min rank attack. And I will just show you why. So the idea of the attack is, is to find a secret code uh, in the system. And uh, the secret code has some properties, so I will not go into details, but uh, the secret code is this one. Uh, and uh, uh, it has relation with the secret uh, and uh, the public uh, entries. And in fact, we can just rewrite everything here, and we see that we have exactly a Kipnish Shamir shape for the system. Uh, and the fact is that the matrices are very specific. Uh, the first matrices are ju have just one non zero column, the other ones have just one non zero row, and the last ones are random. But I'm uh, already finished uh, just to show you. Uh, so we can, uh, we know exactly the shape of the matrices, so we can predict the rank of the matrices and they have a smaller column rank than expected. So we can compute the rank and then compute theoretically uh, the number of columns on which to puncture the code to have a super determined uh, instance and to be able to solve the system. And in this case, we reduce all the programs to matrices of very small size, and it takes few seconds to solve. So to conclude, I think now we have a better understanding of the algebraic systems associated to the mineral problem and why the support miners modeling perform better than the other modelings. And one key ingredient is the use of the precar coordinates. And we have also an example of mineral attack in Hamming code-based crypto and 
I think it's interesting. Thank you. I was a little bit uh, long, sorry. If you have questions. Ray, I can't hear you. You are muted. Uh, thank, th thank you. Um, so I guess uh, we're running a little late, so probably no. I don't see any questions in the chat. So uh, we'll that's it. Maybe on. there's one. So, yeah. Okay. There is a question from Daniel, but uh, I can answer oh, it in the chat. Ah uh, yes, yes. Uh, one one of the interesting things about support miners is that sometimes it's more efficient to solve at a higher degree than the initial uh, bilinear system. Somehow, this fact is dependent on the reduction of redundancy obtained by replacing degree R monomials and the R variables by the so-called minor variables. Does your work give us insight into this fact? Uh, so you mean uh, uh, ah okay. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, uh, something we need to study uh, to, to remove uh, entries or to put your code to get in higher degree. I think uh, for systems that are uh, super determined, uh, it's clearly uh, the, the best thing we can do is to solve uh, at uh, the smaller possible degree and to maybe take less equations than uh, what we have. But uh, no, I, I don't know when it's more efficient to solve at higher degree. Uh, no, I, I don't think my work uh, is inside. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I guess uh, uh, Hiroki, uh, I believe you're up next. Okay. Yeah. Can you see my slide? Right. Go, uh, go ahead. Ah, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Hiroki Kure from the University of Tokyo in Japan. And I want to talk about a uh, new fault attack on the OPA March Variate Shigeru scheme. Uh, this is a joint work with Yutaro Kiyomura, uh, Tatsuya Nagasawa, and Tsuyoshi Takagi. Uh, this is about our uh, contribution. Our uh, fault attack is uh, one of physical attacks that stores cryptographic devices and generate errors, which lead to a security failure of the system. And your signature scheme is one of much more signature schemes. And this is our main result. Uh, we propose a new fault attack on your signature scheme using false calls on the secret key. Three. Oh, hi. Uh, here I want to talk about uh, the key generation of UOV signature scheme. Uh, let n and m be two positive integers, and n is a number of uh, variables, and m is a number of equations. Uh, then first, we generate a uh, invertible quadratic map f equals f1 to fm from fq to the n to fq to the m, and each component of k has like this home. And the sum of alpha ijk xi xj from i equals 1 to n and from j equals 1 to v, uh, this mean. And th that means uh, this fk uh, there exists no quadratic terms in m variables from x b plus 1 to xn. And next, uh, we generate a linear map t from fq to the n to fq to the n. And by composing uh, this f and t, we generate a, a chaotic map p. And this p is a public key. And secret key is, uh, is uh, f and t, like this. And these uh, public and secret keys can be represented as matrices right, like this page. Uh, for each component, fy of the central map f, 
uh, we can take um, enzymes and matrix MFI, uh, satisfying this relationship, FI x equals x1 to xn times MFI times x1 to xn. And then we can take this MFI like this one, uh, whose uh, lower right m, m times m sub matrix is a uh, zero matrix uh, because this part uh, corresponds to our coefficients of quadratic terms in uh, m variables from x b plus one to xn. Uh, we can also take uh, matrix mt representing t like this and for each component, MPI uh, representing PI of the public key. Uh, we have this relationship uh, MPI equals MT transpose times MFI times MT uh, due to the this relationship. <laughs> and uh, this page is about uh, our other existing for the tax on EOV and its variants. And there exist two types uh, for the tax on UOV. And uh, one is to cause a fault to change a coefficient of the secret key. And another type is to cause a fault such that uh, random values uh, used when we generate a signature uh, are fixed to the same values. And this figure is uh, for existing for the tax about for the tax on UOV and its variant rainbow and LEOV. At 2011, Hashimoto et al. proposed a uh, fault attack on rainbow using faults uh, caused on the secret key, and also proposed an uh, attack on EOV and its variance rainbow and LEOV using faults uh, caused on random values. And Ms. et al. Uh, proposed an uh, uh, attack on LEOV uh, using faults caused on the secret key. And in this study, we propose a new fault attack on the plain UOV scheme using faults caused on the secret key, like this video. And this is uh, our attack model. We here mainly follow the model used in the Hashimoto Ito's attack. And in our proposed attack, uh, one fault changes one coefficient of the secret key, f and t. And the coefficient of f and t changed by fault is uh, randomly chosen. So we can expect that uh, faults are caused on the central map f with high probability. And the attacker cannot know the location of the fault and coefficient changed by the fault do not return to the original values, even if new faults are injected. And this is a rough description of our proposed attack. In step one, we recover some rows of the secret key T uh, by utilizing fault scores on the central map F. And like this figure, if the fault is caused on the central map F, then we recover two rows of T and we generate uh, another fault. And if a uh, new fault is caused on the linear map T, then go to step two and transform the public key system P into uh, another public key system P bar with fewer variables than the original system P. So we can perform existing key recovery attacks on this, on the, this resulting system P bar with smaller complexity than, the, than that on the original system. Uh, we here omit uh, the, the explanation of uh, step one. And uh, in step two, we here assume that and the v, first V prime rows of the first V rows and, and the first M prime rows in the last M rows of MT are recovered in step one. Uh, but please note that the attacker does not know which rows of MT are recovered. And by using this information, uh, we can take um, n times n matrix T prime uh, satisfying this, uh, this MT times T prime has like this form. Uh, the right n minus alpha element in 
pre prime plus n prime rows recovered in step one are zeros like this. And by using this t prime, we can uh, transform the public key system. Uh, we here uh, take t prime times uh, x1 to xn transpose as an input of the public key polynomial pi. Then this equals uh, x1 to xn times t prime transpose times mpi uh, written like this form and times t prime times x1 to xn transpose. <laughs> And here, uh, this mt times t prime has like this form uh, due to the fact in the last page, and mfi has like this form. And here we consider substituting uh, zeros uh, for alpha variables from x1 to x alpha uh, because uh, these parts uh, correspond to this non zero this non zero part of mt times t transport, uh, mt times t prime. So by substituting zero, uh, we can cancel this part. So uh, by substituting zero, uh, this equals x alpha plus one to xn times uh, this uh, rectangular matrix, uh, some rows are completely zero, uh, some columns are completely zero, and uh, mfi times uh, such a rectangular matrix times x alpha plus one to xn, and and because uh, these part uh, these some rows and uh, some columns and some rows are uh, completely zero, uh, we can cancel uh, uh, elements as as uh, ones in these four parts. So uh, this can be written like this one by concat this one by concatenating these non-zero part of uh, rectangular matrix and <laughs> these four parts. So as a result, we can see this system as a U of a public key system with only n minus alpha variables with uh, v minus v prime vinegar variables and m minus m prime oil variables. On the resulting smaller system, uh, we can perform existing key recovery attacks uh, with some more complexity and through our simulations uh, for some 100 bit security parameter sets as we confirm that the proposed attack can reduce the given system into one with only 90 bit security with a probability of approximately 80 to 90 percent and uh, the proposed attack works even when the number of fault is limited uh, a naive countermeasure against the proposed attack would be to check whether the secret key is faulty or not uh, before generating a signature. Uh, that's all. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hiroki. Um, so, um, so yeah, I. I I think we have time for, uh, I guess, one or two questions. Uh, I don't see any um, just yet. Um, so, I guess um, one question is, um, so this, this attack uh, is is only reducing security by a, a, a small amount, uh, given um, given the fault, a hundred to ninety. Um, so um, the question is, um, might might it be a, an effective countermeasure uh, just to bump up the security a little bit and and consider the security? With with faults included, uh, I I think uh, uh, this counter measure uh, does not affect on the par parameter. Uh, now this counter measure might be uh, make uh, uh, a little bit slow the signature generation. But I think this doesn't affect the parameter sets. Uh, 
so sorry. Uh, there's there's also a question from um, Scott Fleur and uh, one from Daniel Smith Tone. So from Scott Fleur, uh, would would this attack be detected by the signer attempting to verify the general generated signature? Uh, presumably uh, the yeah. verifier. Uh, I think. Uh, this can be de detected by the signer uh, by using this counter measure uh, uh, to check whether the secret keys uh, has fault or not before generating a signature. Um, and, and and I guess Daniel asks, um, so the probability of reducing the security by 10 bits is 80 or 90 percent. Um, is there a significant probability that the security is reduced by significantly more, like say 40 bits of security. Uh, oh, sorry, what, what, what is this? Um, oh, sorry. So this, um, what, what is the probability? Um, uh, can can uh, the attack reduce more with Security more with lower probability. Uh, yeah, uh, the probability uh, uh, removing it to uh, 30 or 40 bit security is uh, not non negligible. Yes, yes, it's non, -neg non negligible. Yeah. Sorry, I, I don't have uh, actual values here, but, but it's not negligible. Uh, you can see my paper. Uh, you can confirm the probability about that. Thank you. Um, so um, I guess uh, let's move on to the next talk, um, which uh, is uh, Javier Verbal. Thank you. Hi, can you see my slides now? Uh, yes. Um, so, um, so I guess uh, yeah. Next speaker is Javier Rebel, uh speaking about uh, MRDSS, smaller min rank based signatures. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Ray. So, in this talk, I'm going to talk about MRDSS, which is a proposed signature scheme based on the harness of the mini rank problem that also allows for ring signatures. This is joint work with Emanuel Bellini, Andre Esser, and Carlos Sana. And a full description of our paper can be found in this link. So just uh, digital signatures provide uh, authenticity and, and, and integrity for digital messages. Uh, we also require them to be quantum secure in order to be secure against uh, quantum computers. And the current status of the standardization process by NIST is that there are three uh, schemes related for standardization, but still we demand a bit more of uh, diversity in order to increase our portfolio of post-quantum signatures. This is on one side, and on the other side we have the mini rank problem, which is a problem that mainly appears to destroy schemes in crypto. And uh, for this reason, it's uh, been quite the study for crypto analysis of mainly multivariate schemes, but also for code-based schemes. Um, it's a very simple problem. It's easy to describe. It requires very simple operations. And so far, there are very limited proposals based on the harness of this problem. So in this work, we wanted to build uh, a digital signature scheme based on the harness of the mini rank problem. So oh, what's wrong here? So this is not the first work in this line. So 2,000 years ago, Courtois proposed the first zero knowledge protocol in order to, uh, based on the harness of this problem. And then he used the Fiat-Shamir transformation to get a signature scheme. And the zero knowledge protocol he proposed had soundness error of two over three. 
And he also pointed out that his scheme allows for ring signatures, but he didn't uh, formalize this scheme per se. And in our paper, we build over the Courtois scheme and we use the, uh, the Sigma protocol with helper paradigm proposed by Bullens in 2020. And then we use could and choose in order to remove the helper plus the fiat Schmidt transformation in order to get a signature scheme. We can prove that our uh, zero knowledge protocol has owner's error one over two. And then uh, this allows us to get the smaller in, uh, signatures than uh, Courtois scheme. And we also propose a slightly different uh, key generation uh, algorithm so we can get smaller signature schemes. So by, oh, sorry, what is this? Okay, well, while doing this work, uh, we came out with uh, another paper by Santoso, Ikemal, Sunamura, and Yeshuda, where they propose a different approach to build a zero knowledge protocol and they also achieve Sauner's error of one over two. So this is the outline of this talk. And then okay. So the mini rank problem as uh, you saw in previous talk, uh, the input is given by a set of matrices M0 to MK and an integer R. And what we have to find is just a set of coefficients in the final field such that the rank of this linear combination is smaller than R. About this problem is known that it is NP complete and it's been, uh, it, it, it is also known that for random instances, uh, this problem is also hard. As you can see in the definition of the problem, it involves only linear algebra computation. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it's been the core problem in the recent cryptanalysis of Rainbow, James, and Rollo. It is also believed that this problem is quantum secure. There are not quantum algorithms improving the efficiency of how we solve this problem. So we use this paradigm, which was introduced by Bullens in 2020. And basically here we have a sigma protocol and in a sigma protocol we have a prover and a verifier and the goal is that the prover wants to convince a verifier that he holds a witness w which is related with a public value x such that the pair x w belongs to a set of relations. And here the helper is just a third party which is trusted by the prover and the verifier that will set up, uh, will, will perform the a previous computation so that the prover and the verifier can achieve their goal. And basically what the prover is gonna do is it's gonna sample a seed and it's gonna compute a setup function. It will send the seed to the prover and the auxiliary information to the verifier, which is the output of the setup uh, function. And then the prover and the verifier will follow a normal, a normal three pass protocol. And at the end, the verifier will compute, will do some computation, taking into account the message exchange in the protocol. And then the verifier at the end will accept or reject, where accept means that the verifier believes that the prover holds the secret value W. So I'm gonna take some time to explain how our zero knowledge protocol works. Here, our public value is gonna be just the instance of the mini rank problem, while the secret value is gonna be the solution of the mini rank problem, which is a vector alpha and the low rank matrix, where the low rank matrix is just the matrix we obtain by performing the linear combination. And of course, this rank matrix, it should have rank less than R. And then we are gonna take this equation and we're gonna take a matrix T, a matrix S, and a vector beta. And we are gonna perform this uh, computation here, which is at the end very simple. We just compute this linear combination using the coefficients in beta, 
we add and subtract this combination, and then we multiply the whole equation by t on the left and s on the right, and then we have this. Uh, we 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 get that this uh, equation here holds, and this is going to be the main uh, equation for a protocol, because what the what the helper is going to do to set up the pre-computation of the protocol is basically the helper will sample the vector beta and the two matrices, and the helper will compute this matrix N1, and he, uh, it will pre-compute it by T and S, and it will commit to the, this uh, multiplication here, and also it will commit to the matrices T and S. And as in a normal protocol with helper, the helper will send the seed to the prover and the auxiliary information, which is going to be COM0 and COM1, to the verifier. And then the prover and the verifier will follow the following protocol. So the prover starts by committing to the multiplication of TN2 times S, where N2 is just another linear combination of the public matrices, but now using the secret key alpha. And then it will commit to the, uh, to this value, we'll send it to the verifier. The verifier will sample uh, a challenge from the set zero and one. We'll send it to the prover, and the prover will generate uh, a pair R1 and R2, where R1 and R2 are equal to these two matrices, which we just, uh, described before, and we'll send it to the verifier, otherwise it will send the matrices S and T, and the vector, uh, the mask secret key, which is alpha masked by, by beta. And then the verifier will basically perform the required checking that it has to perform, and everything matches, then it will accept uh, the verifier as a true holder of the solution of the given minibank problem. So in our scheme, so as I mentioned before, we have this zero knowledge protocol with helper, then we use a good and choose a strategy to remove the helper. And after this, we have a, a, a zero knowledge protocol without a helper, and then we apply the fiat Schmidt transformation in order to get the, a signature scheme. And in the key generation of our signature scheme, we just sample these values at random. We sample the matrices M1 to MK at random. The low rank matrices are random and the solution are random. And then we just define the matrix M0 as a this computation here. And then we just set our public key to be the set of matrices and our secret key to be the low rank matrix E and the solution vector alpha. In order to, well, we also propose two, two optimization for the scheme. The first one is aiming to reduce the size of the public key. And to do this, we basically, we change a bit the key generation process and we choose these vectors, these coefficients alpha to match a fixed set of entries of the matrix E. So at the end, the matrix M0 will have uh, K coordinates, sorry, K0 coordinates. So the size of our public key, which is mainly the amount of memory we have to need to, in order to store M0, goes from M times N times the log of Q to M times N minus K uh, multiplied by the log, log of Q. Another uh, optimization we propose here, as you saw in the, when the challenge is zero, the prover have to send the matrices T and one and S, and the matrices uh, T and two and S. And then what the verifier have to check is that the linear combination is, uh, sorry, the difference between these two matrices is has uh, rank smaller than R. So, uh, uh, Potential optimization here is just to, instead of sending this full matrix, we just send the low rank matrix, which is the difference. And then we require less bits in order to set a low rank matrix than, than, right, than a full rank matrix. And the improvement goes from this value to this value, but uh, it 
give small signatures when R is small enough. Okay, I can read. Okay, we, we, we propose three set of parameters for our scheme. Uh, all of them achieve in category, one of the next categories of security, one for category one, one for category three, and one for category five. These are basically the parameters we propose. And And then we can see that for these parameters, if we plug in uh, these values in our uh, signature size complex uh, formulas, we get this uh, signature size for our category one. And if we do the same for Courtois scheme by using these parameters, then we get this signature size on, in these columns. So for all the parameter sets, we can see that we can reduce the size of the signatures in comparison with Courtois scheme by uh, by roughly a factor of two, and then we also gain a bit less than a, fact, a bit less than a, than a factor of two in the in the public key size by applying our optimization. So, as a summary of this talk, we propose a new mini rank based signature scheme. It uses a three pass zero knowledge protocol with helper, and then it applies via Shamir. The zero knowledge protocol has soundness error one of over two. We improve by a factor of about two the signature size of Courtois scheme. It is believed to be quantum secure because of the underlying problem is believed to be quantum secure. And it also allows for ring signatures. I didn't explain in this talk, but in the full talk, you can see how we can build ring signatures for, from this scheme. And I see two interesting future uh, questions here. One of them is just to get more efficient protocol in, the, in, the, in terms of soundness, so uh, more zero knowledge uh, protocols to prove the solution of a mini run problem with smaller soundness will lead to signature scheme with smaller signature sizes. And another very interesting question is how to build trapdoor schemes based on the mini run problem. And that is uh, basically my talk, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, um, see if there's a question. Okay, so um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, just a quick question um, for the ring signature scheme. How does the size of the ring uh, affect the performance? Yeah, it's, it's linear. It's not logarithmic that does uh, other schemes, but it's still for a small number of, for a small number of users, it's, it's kind of uh, competitive in terms of signature size. But since the growing is linear in the number of users, then for very big, let's say 4,000 users, is uh, less efficient than other proposals. Yep. Uh, uh, thank you. And so I guess we're about five minutes behind. So let's uh, move on to the next okay. speaker. Uh, okay. Our next speaker. Um, is uh, Ryan Carter, I believe. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, with IP Rainbow. Um, can you hear me? We are having problems. Uh, I, I, I can hear you. Um, uh, oh, now I can't. What about now? What, about now? what if I yell? Yes, I hear you. At my volume and so um hello every thank you. uh so, so we're we're still having a, a bit of an audio problem here
Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. I can't hear you there. You got to lean in, I think. So um, we are going to be talking and joint work with myself, Max Carter, Mark Lewis, and Dean. Um, and so what this is going to be is a new variant. Um, so to start this presentation, we are just going to review um, UOV. So in the UOV signature scheme, um, we have these central maps um, and they have two types of variables. So we will take on input um, vectors in F, Q to the E. And so the first V of those elements um, will be our vinegar variables and the remaining element oil variables. So when we look at our central map, we can see that um, our quadratic in the vinegar variables are actually linear in the oil. And so in five, but then round of the um we have this layered construction. So when we look is going to be um, and so again what's going to happen static in the vinegar and um, and then what's going to is our vinegar size of our rainbow in practice we what it would look like matrices zero coordinate um, and then all the um recently there have been singular men rank which Oh, sorry about my audio. I don't know what's happening. But um, also are going to talk briefly about the simple attack at Ward Um, We don't have to talk about it too much right here because um, the work tomorrow. But before we talk about this actual, um, we want to talk about some background information. First thing we want to talk about is what the discrete, so the discrete differential of the public key um, you see that normally you would consider x. The differential of that would be p of x y. That would be equal to p of x plus y minus p of x minus p of y. And so what this is going to is it will depress the degree he was at an extra variable. So if our potential of it um, substructure of our oil and so our O2 space is our layer two oil subspace. Subset of our oil one subspace. 
of our entire space f two to the now remember when we were talking about the rainbow map we knew that it is quadratic in the it is linear in the oil variables so if we wanted to um a specific element the way that we could do that is random elements called for our oil or o2 um, we're going to get a um, if we plug in our oil one elements and we are going to be um, and then if the element it is in have something interesting in more but if you take any element from o2 you compute potential um, with an element any other element in f that is going to be used So again, we won't do this in much detail because but basically what we want the rest of the attack break rainbow in a weekend. Um, but what we're doing is you're going to fix non-zero X our input space. And so we're going to once we have this D number, we want to that. So that dx of y is an O2. So for a fixed x, probability, probability that there is a non-trivial kernel um, such that d of x is equal to y is this Q and so we use that um, in order to really have intense speed ups in the attack. All right, so what we are looking at is thinking about applying the internal perturbation modifier to the rainbow public key. So what that modifier is, is that you are going to take from vector Q, M elements with S, and it's going to be a vector at those quadratic maps. Based so specific. Normal first, level. and we are going to quadratic summing that will contain. So we're going to have some in the oil vector, oil elements. our maps. So again, we have these non-zero coordinates where we're going to have our vector 
vinegar times vinegar or vinegar times oil. Um, and our layer two, it's going to be the exact same thing, but here we're going to have a small s by s squared that is going to be quadratic in the oil. Um, so when we look at the signing algorithm for this new IP, it's going to be basically the same as the signing algorithm regular rainbow, um, but now we have to deal with um, so basically what we're going to find random values to our layer one vinegar variables, use that to solve for layer oil, go all through there. The only thing that's different is once we have finished solving for um, our layer one maps, you're going to then end up with these S variables that are quadratic. So in order to do to solve those, we're going to need to use Grobner basis algorithm. Once we've done that, um, we will end up with some signature. Um, and while this is loading, I will tell you that that is going to um, but it's also going to add a lot of security. So when we want to look at the security rainbow, you can see that now, if we were to apply the simple attack, um, the probability that we would have a non, that the oil two vector is going to um, be in of the public key instead of that being the negative one is what we're going to find for being able to solve the dx of y and the p of y equals. Now we're going to have q to the negative one minus s um, because we have to pay s quadratic terms because now our oil space is not a subspace of the kernel of our public key. Um, this also does similar, has a similar effect on the min rank attack. Where it's going to incre increase things. So when we are looking at our scheme, we can see that we now have this Q to the S term. So that is now showing up in our complexity. Um, if S gets really big, inversion becomes very slow because we are solving an S by S system using Grobner basis technique. So because we have this Q to the S, we wanted our Q to be a little bit larger. So we are considering Q to be two. Um, we compared our scheme with the parameters to the um, two comparable UOV parameters. When we look at NIST level one, you can see here's our range for S. And you can see that when S is large, the signing time is slightly unreasonable, even if you're doing offline signature. Um, but the key sizes are very small. Um, and then when we move to smaller S's, um, the key sizes, compare those to the UOV um, and compare the. Um, we also have. Um, same thing where we have this trade off where um, we have these nice security levels um, with the smaller key sizes when S is large, but the signing time takes a while. <laughs> um, and so these are not optimized, um, but it's interesting to see that trade off in security versus efficiency. References, these slides are. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so, um, 
So I guess, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see questions, and I guess you're still having some some audio problems too. But yeah, I mean, got most of it. Uh, so, um, so yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I guess let's uh, move on. I guess Daniel is next. Yeah, I'm trying to start up here. Uh, looks like we're about seven minutes late, but I can just cut down on uh, how do I share my slides that I already uploaded? I'm lost here. I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to share the slides that I already uploaded. Um, as upload a presentation. Okay, I just look through it this way. Uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I, I couldn't. I couldn't quite hear. Can you hit the circle? There we go. Thank you. Thank you. You are now muted. Okay. You just want me to start, Ray? Uh, yeah, yeah, go for okay. it. <laughs> okay. Sure. okay, if you're waiting there, that, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just try to go really fast. Okay, so uh, uh, this paper is, is presenting uh, a, a new idea for uh, creating multivariate encryption schemes. Uh, just the, the point is to put something out there and hopefully have something that's a target for cryptanalysis so that we can learn in the silence. That's that's the main point for this. So I'll, I'll try to breeze through these uh, first slides quickly. <coughs> uh, the basic objective in cryptanalysis typically for multivariate crypto systems is just to be able to solve a system of equations. And, and so how to best do that depends on the structure of, of those equations. Uh, so one method that is generic and applies to, to any system is you could try to solve it directly with some algorithm for solving uh, polynomial systems. And generally the complexity of these uh, sorts of attacks uh, depend on uh, coming up with the Hilbert series. Sometimes the special structure of the equations change it from this, but if you have a generic system with M equations and N variables, uh, this is the Hilbert series that's relevant. Uh, the idea of this K is you're guessing the values of K variables. Okay. Uh, so an attack that has broken a big family of, of multivariate crypto systems would be a differential attack. Uh, the idea for, for these uh, attacks is that there's the, the rank is so low for these schemes that there are symmetries related to linear maps uh, embedded in the input. And you can see that with, with the differential. And so somehow applying a linear map to inputs, it filters out to a linear map on the output. And it can be simpler than this as well. This is uh, the form that broke, for example, S flash and these other schemes. Uh, but it could be simpler where just applying a linear map on one input filters to a linear map on the output. Okay, and then uh, rank attacks. Uh, so there are various flavors of rank attacks. Uh, they could be high rank and low rank, but uh, usually we're more concerned about min rank attacks and they have this flavor. And Magali already spoke about this uh, the first talk of the, of the session. Uh, you have a bunch of matrices and you're looking for a linear combination over some extension field of the field containing the coefficients of the matrices so that the thing is, is low rank. So this is the general form of this. Most often we're using E equal to F, so it's a degree one extension, uh, but for big field schemes often you're using a higher degree extension. Okay, so uh, let's examine the square crypto system. This is from the early 2000s and look at how these attacks apply to it very briefly. So the square crypto system is an example of a big field crypto system. Uh, you take an extension field, a degree M extension, it looks like here, uh, take some uh, quadratic, so FQ quadratic map F over the extension field, 
And via vector space isomorphisms, you can realize it as a vector valued map. And then you hide that structure by having an affine transformation on the input and on the output, so U and T here. In the case of square, uh, that map upstairs is just squaring and Q is chosen to be an odd prime power. And so uh, you actually have in general, a two to one map. <clears throat> okay. So uh, attacks on square, basically, basically everything works to break square. Uh, we just didn't know that at the time. Uh, the direct attack uh, likely works. I actually haven't checked this fully. Uh, there was a paper uh, in 2019, I believe it was uh, Carlos Sid and some others uh, examining eFlash and arguing that you could attack it directly uh, based off of some relations related to the Frobenius. Uh, and, and so it's, it's likely that those apply to, to square as well. Uh, differential attacks, there are a couple of flavors of those that apply to square because it has one of those very simple differential relations. Uh, and then rank attacks, there's a traditional way of attacking big field schemes with rank attacks. Uh, I think the paper that spells out the details the best is from 2013, uh, Fougere, Perret, and, and some others uh, attacking multi-HFE. Uh, and then there's the new style of rank attack uh, from just a couple of years ago that broke uh, gems. Uh, and so I call that the Tawadol style of rank attack. And the complexity of these two attacks are identical in the case of, of square. Okay, so all of these attacks, what they have in common is that you're considering linear maps. It's, it has to do with uh, linear properties. Uh, you can take linear combinations of the public maps and recover some structure of the, of the central map. So can we do some modification on the output that is not linear, that can remove those properties uh, so that we can potentially have a secure scheme based off of really efficiently invertible maps. Okay, so the idea for doing that, that, that I'm proposing in this paper, uh, is I call it 2F for two fields. Uh, it's, it's modulus switching, essentially. So this is not the first time this has happened in crypto, but uh, but I'd like to examine it in the context of, of multivariate crypto. So the idea here is you start with a map F that's uh, from N variables to N equations uh, over FP and map that map, map that function to a new field with a new characteristic. And so I'm going to Q here. So FQ, I'm thinking of these as actually primes, P and Q. And uh, the map is just having the same coefficients. So whatever least residue mod P you had for your coefficients of F up here, use that same number downstairs here in Q, and then uh, put an FQ linear map T on the end of it and come up with your public key that way. Okay, the idea is that if I do an FQ linear transformation on that, that's not FP linear. And the FP linear stuff that you may have up here, FP linear combinations, uh, don't, aren't compatible with this FQ linear map. And so hopefully this can me mess up all of the attacks that we, we have in multivariate schemes. And, and in fact, that, that seems, to be, seems to be true. Uh, so here's a, a slight example, a tiny example, just to illustrate what's going on. So uh, here I have some values V1, 2, 3, and I have three variable inputs. I have coefficients here from between minus three and three because those are the least uh, absolute residues mod seven. I may have said least uh, non-negative residues before. I meant least absolute residues. And, uh, and then I can compare this with another prime Q that's much larger than, than, than P. Okay, so uh, I could imagine plugging in some values and I restrict my values to be uh, least residues mod P. I don't have any instances here of three or minus three because I probably forgot my arithmetic at the uh, But you can just compute these values. And if I compute those values as integers and take them mod P, which is what I would normally do in a, a multivariate scheme, then I would get these values. Uh, however, if I just compute them over the integers, I get these values. So minus 16, minus 27, 23, uh, but 
the critical thing is if I if I do the calculation mod 331, I get exactly those same values because this prime is large enough that uh, adding and subtracting multiples of Q, if I compute mod Q, doesn't affect anything. The value over the integers is the same as the value over Q. Uh, however, if I were to compose this function that gave me these values, if I were to compose that with an FQ linear transformation, I can get some other output. And these are completely made up values. The, the, I didn't actually make a matrix and do this. Uh, but I can get something else that looks different. Now those values, if I were to compute those directly from a key that included that uh, FQ linear map on it, uh, then I would be doing lots of adding and subtracting of multiples of Q. So there would be a lot of reduction mod Q going on in the calculation. Uh, so, uh, but it's all due to that uh, linear transformation that I, that I call T. It's all due to that linear transformation and not the structure of that central map. Okay, so uh, here is an explanation of why this can work to give us something that's still efficiently invertible. Uh, if your prime is sufficiently large, uh, then if you just apply T inverse, uh, that takes care of all of the operations mod Q. And so you get a unique pre-image for that. And now that is the output of the actual integral calculation, calculation over the integers. So take it mod P, and then you have what the output of the calculation is over FP. And then you can invert just as you did before. Okay. So uh, the reason for choosing this inequality is to introduce no new decryption failures this way. So whatever your map was, any potential it had to have a decryption failure would be preserved exactly uh, if you have this quality satisfied by your two primes, P and Q. Okay, but you don't have to do this. Uh, quadratic distributions, which is what we're looking at, the output of something that's a quadratic relation of the inputs, they're actually pretty tight. So you can choose a much smaller Q uh, in relation to P and still have this work with cryptographic strength. Uh, but of course, there's something else you can do as well. You don't have to allow inputs to be any uh, least absolute residue mod P. You could just choose ternary inputs. And, and have it be, be fine. And in that case, you can even choose your P to be larger uh, in relation to Q uh, to optimize for lattice properties, okay? That's the, the whole point of, of that, that modification. Okay, so how, how, are, fact, how are attacks affected? Well, uh, we still have uh, some relations here. So instead of the traditional field equations, the restriction of our inputs to this small set inside of FQ, uh, we can still represent that with, uh, with a, a polynomial. And, and so we have a different sort of Hilbert series than we had before, okay? Uh, so, so we have to take that into consideration. Uh, but, but it actually protects against uh, those big field relations that have to do with something commuting with the Frobenius because the characteristics are wrong. Uh, characteristic being wrong changes the differential attacks as well, so it messes that up uh, so that the, the structure isn't there anymore. Uh, for rank attacks also, uh, so there is a low rank, for big field schemes, there's a low rank uh, linear combination over a characteristic P field, the extension field, that gives you a low rank matrix. Uh, but your public key related to those, it's actually an FQ linear transformation for that. So you don't have an FP linear relation of the public key that's low rank or FQ in general. So it messes up the rank attacks, but it introduces the possibility for lattice attacks. So in the paper, I analyzed some lattice attacks uh, based off of a lattice that looks like this. Uh, the idea here being that there is an FQ linear transformation of, of, of P, the public equations, that gives you something that has very small coefficients. <clears throat> so... Uh, it's the basis for a lattice attack. So Ray here, uh, I talked to him about this, <laughs> and he, uh, uh, he, he has a, a trick for a much better lattice attack. And it's, it's nothing that's outlandish. It's something that's a fairly standard technique. Uh, but I shouldn't talk about that because that's not my result. Uh, but it does break the parameters that I proposed in the paper. Uh, but I was already worried about that anyway. And so this uh, idea of switching P and Q, making P, Q, P larger and Q smaller, uh, should take care of that just fine and still produce an efficient scheme 
uh, much more efficient than what we have. Okay, so uh, why did I use Square in this? Uh, because Square has all of these attacks, it's vulnerable in every way. <clears throat> So it's a good target for this. And I would like to see more targets like this if people are interested in studying this modulus switching. Uh, so here are some parameters for this. Uh, broken here does not apply to ABC and PCBM. I realized that after making this slide that it looks like that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. Uh, uh, those, those are safe. The, the parameters I have below for the 2F scheme, th those are broken by Ray's, Ray's attack. Uh, but this does still give a flavor of the size of the scheme, uh, even for things that are secure, as far as I know. Uh, and it shows a, a huge advance in performance. For secure parameters, uh, I think you have really fairly similar per, uh, sizes over here for plain text, ciphertext, and public key. Uh, the encryption should be the same, roughly. Uh, decryption, instead of being like half a millisecond, it's, it's something like 13 milliseconds, as far as I know. So still way better than these figures for other secure uh, multivariate encryption schemes. Okay, and so, uh, yeah, so 30, I, I just said that. So I'll go to the next slide. And it's not popping up for me, but uh, yeah, th th this scheme has very interesting properties, I think, for, for encryption. Uh, pretty small ciphertext, it does a pretty good job with that. It still has large public keys, of course. It's a multivariate scheme. It's fairly slow decryption, uh, but the small ciphertext I think is, is, is a really interesting plus uh, for this. And hopefully somebody can figure out how to use it better than I did. Uh, and so going forward, what I'd like to, to see is, is hopefully this thing broken, but broken by a different means that lets us actually learn something. Uh, I don't think I learned very much from, from Ray's attack, unfortunately, but, uh, uh, but it, it would be interesting to see if, if this can be turned into something that's an actual technology that somebody would want to use. <laughs> so I, I should stop there since we're running out of time. No. Yep. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess we should uh, give, give people a chance to get ready uh, in what's left, left of the break and uh, we can take discussion to Zulip. All right, thank you. Thank you.